come back with new visions, new programs, new conversations with some of the most important and um, uh, challenging uh, writers, thinkers, uh, film producers, and uh, people who venture into doing all kinds of uh, practices uh, with which viewers have been uh, quite rightly uh, associating the productions of Afghan ascent. Uh, my guest this afternoon, uh, tonight, uh, Professor Nigel Gibson, uh, is not merely a colleague, a brilliant colleague that I admire, uh, but much more humanely, uh, he's a friend. We've been friends for many, many years, uh, but because of our busy schedules, um, we haven't been uh, hanging uh, out together uh, as we did during the few years that um, I spent at Emerson College of Music, in which I was a, uh, an associate professor of philosophy and he was a uh, professor of political science. Uh, since then, uh, we have parted company, have gone to the shores of Brown University for a few years, and then and from there uh, to Berkeley College of Music, uh, in which I am a, an associate professor of uh, philosophy and um, uh, literature. Uh, at the moment, um, uh, a job, uh, a task that is more than a job and uh, a task. Um, it is um, a living um, exemplification of the kind of work and the contribution that I have always attempted to do to the human condition. Uh, Professor Nigel um, Gibson um, uh, does exactly the same uh, at Emerson College, uh, in which he teaches um, uh, courses in cultural studies, uh, post-colonial studies, and uh, in addition to that, uh, he's also an extremely busy and uh, challenging writer. Uh, he has thus far, uh, I expect more, uh, produced something like eight books, uh, one of which the post-colonial imagination won, uh, won one of the most uh, prestigious awards in the field from the Caribbean um, Philosophical Association. Uh, his work has um, uh, cover a wide spectrum of uh, cultural, political, and philosophical matters, but he is particularly known, uh, along with Luz Gordon, uh, who is a frequent contributor uh, to uh, African ascent um, on Franz Fanon. Uh, Franz Fanon, uh, for those of you who do not know much about him, was a 20th century luminary, a revolutionary, a psychiatrist, a political theorist, a, um, a philosopher, uh, an activist, and an organic intellectual of a particular modality. And um, his work continue to um, give us um, the living flames of analysis of the situation of the condemned, as he called them, uh, or the wretched of the earth, um, uh, witnessing uh, recent events such as the influx of unhappy, materially deprived immigrants uh, uh, from Central America and beyond. Uh, then the contradictions and disappointments in uh, South Africa itself, on which um, uh, Professor uh, Nigel Gibson uh, continues to produce a flurries of writings, uh, prove to us and prove to those who do not know anything about Fanon that the spirit and the intelligence of uh, Fanon lives on. And so, African Ascent is truly honored and uh, privileged uh, to bring uh, Professor Nigel Gibson uh, to converse with me um, on the works of Franz Fanon. Thank you very Welcome much. Welcome to Ted Afghanistan. Ross. Thank you, Ted Ross. Uh, looking forward to speaking with you tonight. Well, uh, I don't even know where to begin, um, um, uh, but uh, let me begin here. Um, how about if you took um, your time um, uh, through your cool, uh, cool style uh, to introduce uh, my audience, uh, thousands of them, uh, to who Fanon was, um, where he's from, uh, what he has produced, and most importantly, why you are interested in him and why you continue to produce some remarkable work such as the one that you just published which I would like to expose to my audience uh, Fanonian practices in South Africa uh, Fanonian uh, practices in South Africa uh, fresh from the press well uh, let me first say just to sort of contextualize how I got interested in Fanon, which, which, which is going to be different for different generations. I mean, Fanon, we, we remember, wrote uh, three important books. So one, Black Skin, White Mask in 1952, 
which he begins, on the, I think, on the second paragraph to say, I do not bring timeless truth. So we, don't, we can't look at Fanon as someone who's going to give us some timeless ideas that we just look at it as a, as a toolbox to take pieces from. Um, and that's why I think one has to sort of recreate Fanon, um, engage with his thought, but recreate it in the moments that, that, that one lives in, in the sort of historical, contextual moments that one is living in. So for me, Fanon was interesting for that very moment, uh, um, in the sense that um, in the late 70s, a young student interested in politics, interested in what was happening in South Africa, interested in the emergence of the black consciousness movement, Steve Biko's black consciousness movement um, had become world known because of Soweto in 1976 when the students went on strike uh, and were gunned down by the apartheid regime, but also after his death in 1977. So there I was a young student coming to uh, engage black consciousness, this, this idea of black consciousness, which, which had um, which was important to young, young black students, that uh, they, were not non, they weren't non-whites, that they were black, and, and in a certain sense, uh, standing on um, black consciousness in the US, but also through Fanon's ideas, they were raising the notion of their own identity, their own, their own um, blackness, which was not, Biko famously said, a pigment uh, of the skin, but a state of mind. So, the engagement with, with uh, Fan, my engagement with Fanon came through Steve Biko, but mediated through two authors who are, who are uh, black American authors, uh, Lou Turner and John Allen. They'd written this pamphlet, and I was in London at the time, so I, I came across this pamphlet uh, called um, uh, France Fanon, Soweto and American Black Thought. So I was interested in this connection between Franz Fanon and Steve Biko. How could someone like Franz Fanon, who'd written in the 1950s um, and, and early 90s, in other words, he died in 1962, 1961, end of 19, December 1961, Black, uh, Wretched of the Earth was written in, in, uh, in, 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 as he lay dying, published in late 1961. How could someone who was then 15 years dead uh, become important for, a for another movement that was in South Africa where where uh, uh, Fanon never was uh, uh, and was never active. So uh, that's, that was the connection. And then that's, that's sort of the connection to the idea of Fanonian practices. In a certain sense, how can thought, and really it's a philosophical issue, how can thought be alive in new situations? What is there about someone's thought, Fanon in this particular case, that can be uh, applied to and be uh, come alive in a different situation? So that's what I was excited about as, as a 19-year-old uh, in, 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 in London at that time. Um, how does thought take on a, a new sort of concreteness? How can it be practiced, in other words? How, how is theory practiced? Not just sort of an abstract theory, but how does it, how does it come alive? So, um, that's how I came across Fanon, and that's why Fanon was interested to me. And of course, the, the interesting thing is, for, this, for your audience, is that it's also mediated by the fact that Fanon became world known as, as a figure through, uh, through, through the Black Power Movement and through the US. In fact, Le, Le Damne de la Terre, the Wretched of the Earth, had no real resonance in France. Uh, in, the, in the early 1960s. It was only with the translation in 1963 and then the publication in 1965 that it became, you know, a book that was written, that was read throughout the world and it became um, millions sold through that American edition. It's an American tradition, it's American translation um, that became the translation that, that was surreptitiously brought into South Africa in the late 1960s through um, the black theology movement. Uh, in other words, theologians in South Africa started reading people like James Cone and others, and that was how Fanon made his way in, and surreptitiously uh, uh, copies of, of The Wretched of the Earth were being handed, you know, ha handed around uh, a st student movement, and Biko was, was a student, um, and that was the part of the birth of, of, of black consciousness. So, so, that was, so that was partly the idea of what Fanonian practices is, 
And what I was particularly interested in then, uh, and why Fanon has remained alive to me, is how does Fanon talk to a uh, contemporary period? And he does in a, different, in a number of different ways. And I was thinking on the way over here um, that he, of that, of that line in A Dying Colonialism, when, when the oppressed, in, and when he talks about the oppressed, he's talking about people in, in he's talking specifically about people in col colonial settler col colonism in, in, in Algeria, but, he, but you can relate it to different situations. Mm -hmm. um, he says that under um, colonial rule, that the oppressed, um, there's a kind of Manichaean situation that you sort of react to, there's a reactive situation where the oppressed just react to the conditions that they're in and even uh, take on um, positions that are objectively not worth taking on. In other words, they're objectively um, problematic. Uh, they, they are that you, you react to the lie of the oppressor with another lie. And I was thinking about this, um, and this might be sort of controversial, I'm not saying that Fanon would, would, would approve, but he would understand it. In other words, the rise of um, ISIS in, in the Middle East, in Iraq uh, and, and, and Syria. It's, an, it's, it's, it's it, you know, I'm not talking about the leadership of them, I'm just talking about the fact that they might be uh, attractive to certain people. And the attraction might be that because objectively they're horribly reactionary, but they're horribly reactionary in, in a reaction to uh, a, horrible, a horrible situation, right? In other words, uh, Fanon understood that. He tried, to, he tried to understand uh, what the conditions were, the conditions very, very often of violence, and the fact that um, that, that violence, and there is a counter uh, violence. That doesn't mean that he actually supported it. Um, he just tried to understand that. So that was what, so, so one can use Fanon in that kind of way. Like, in other words, uh, try to understand why uh, is something as abhorrent as, as, uh, as Islamic fundamentalism uh, or, or a, a caliphate, uh, the idea of a caliphate in, in, in the Middle East, something that is being objectively chosen when it's objectively reactionary, right? So uh, that, that's something that he, that, that he's, so he, in other words, he's willing to engage, not, not support. He doesn't support anything like that, but he's willing to engage the most most difficult questions, the question of violence, for example, very, very difficult question. And, and so one thing is, on, on one hand, I wanted to see how Fanon related to contemporary, <coughs> contemporary events. And the other thing that, that uh, has been part of my work <coughs> is in a certain sense to try to, you know, I wouldn't say rescue, but, uh, but um, there is so much written about Fanon that is just wrong. Right, so that's been also part of my work to try to sort of point out, in fact, that when he engages the question of violence, it's not because he's he's a violent man and, and loves violence. In fact, he's not a violent man and doesn't love violence at all. He tries to understand that vi violence is an issue that's there in society, in, in the community, in, a, in an oppressed community. There's violence. The question is how to understand it and how to, you know, he's he's. He's a psychiatrist by training, so he's interested in releasing that pent-up pent aggression that is often forced backwards into the self or onto the community, onto the oppressed community of which you're part. So that's, so that's, a, that's, a, that's another element. But specifically with Fanonian practices in South Africa, it also what I wanted to talk about, it had a three-part structure. So one was Biko. How did Biko... Uh, engage Fanon? How was Fanonian practices engaged by Biko? What's his relationship to South Africa? But it wasn't only about South Africa, although that was the case study. It could be anywhere. Someone else has to do a study somewhere else. I was just kind of laying the challenge down to other people. Well, you know, you figure that out for, for your own uh, nation. Uh, but also, how was Fanon's critique, and I think you mentioned it in the introduction, his critique of the pitfalls of national consciousness, his critique of of, of, of national consciousness, his critique of, of national leaders, the degeneration of the idea of liberation into sort of a kleptocracy and this, this um, uh, 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 you know, often um, narrowing into, in, into regionalism or racism or, or, uh, 
or uh, indigeneity, you know, um, and so forth. His idea of, of national liberation was, was an opening up uh, rather than the closing down. So how could his, his critique of, nas- uh, of, his, uh, of, of, the, of the degeneration of the nationalist parties uh, be applied to South Africa? And it seemed to me that, that uh, when I talked to uh, uh, students in South Africa about Fanon and they started reading uh, Pitfalls of National Consciousness in the Wretched of the Earth, they said, oh, look, this is the ANC. Oh, look, that Zuma. Or, you know, and all these, it became immediately sort of recognizable to them that some of the things that he was talking about, about the corruption, about the degeneration of the party, uh, and, and so forth, uh, about the ethnic language and so forth, was all directly applicable to South Africa. So that was another element that I wanted to actually use that and analyze you know, what, what I think thought was happening after 1994, because for all of us, and this went back to my 1970s period, the idea that the liberation of South Africa would be, tremen- would be tremendous, a tremendous thing for Africa, not only for S- South Africa, but Southern Africa, for some reason, probably uh, romantically, I thought that it would open up uh, the liberation of the African continent because you had Zimbabwe, you had Mozambique, you had Angola, and now South Africa was the real giant and the whole thing could open up and, be a, and, and you could actually build a new society. You know, there would be a, a, a real change. You know, it, now that didn't happen, but you know, that was and for many reasons. Um, but uh, I thought that uh, Fanon could tell us something about, you know, the great, a great liberation struggle. I mean, the South African liberation struggle was, you know, one of the most, you know, the, the longest, the most drawn out, theoretically, probably the most sophisticated. Yeah. Um, and so it could tell us something about what happened, you know, what happened, what happened to, to all the dreams that this, of, of that, um, that South Africa, uh, that, that the people in the struggle ha- had had and, and had died for, many had died for. So, you know, I wanted to analyze what had actually happened in South Africa that now, um, you know, 20 years on is not the society that many people had fought for. Um, And also at the third time, look at emerging movements. So that was the other, that was the third part, that the Fanon's concept was not just to apply, um, you know, like a ready-made, oh, well, the degeneration of national liberation, we could talk about that in the African continent, you know, 30 years, right? You, you know, I, I think uh, Ali Missouri once said that the, the, the struggles are simply a footnote to Wretched of the Earth. You know, like they, they'd all gone through that whole uh, struggle, uh, you know, of, of coups and, 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 uh, and so forth. Okay. And now, uh, there are those um, who think that there are some internal contradictions between black mass and white skin, the wretched of the earth, and dying colonialism. Do you also sense contradictions in these works, or are they attempts at relentless refinement of, let's say, the theme of oppression? First through the lens of race, then through the lens of class and race, and finally through the lens of culture, race and class, in which the lens of race is present in black skin and white masks. The complex blend of race and class is played out in the wretched of the earth. And finally, a much more complex analysis of race, class, and culture is exhibited in Dying Colonialism and the other essays which followed. Mm -hmm. Or do you sense some irredeemable contradictions among and between the three works? What's your take on that? I mean, it's a very good question. It's a question we could could, uh, write books about. I think my... I see Fanon as his work as, uh, as a whole, as a totality. And it doesn't mean that um, one could just, that what he's worked out in Black Skin, White Masks um, 
is then simply uh, the basis for, for all, all the other work. Um, it's interesting, at the Caribbean Philosophy Association, there was a, a, a number of talks, and I, I was surprised by one that basically thought that um, what Fanon had spoken about in the, um, in the conclusion to Black Skin, White Mask, where he says, I'm not going to be a slave of history. Um, I'm not going to be a slave of the past. You know, everything is about the future. Um, and here's the young man of 25 really talking about the future. I don't want to talk about the past. Um, and relating that to uh, Fanon's uh, critique of jazz in The Wretched of the Earth. As you remember, he talks about, um, he's very critical of blues. Um, I'm not sure if he understands it, but the thing is, I think what he's doing in The Wretched of the Earth is really talking about the difference between swing and bebop. He's really excited about bebop. He thinks bebop is going to be, you know, in talking about culture, in other words, in other words, bebop is a new form that's, um, that, that, exp that, that reflects the American struggle uh, against racism uh, that, that is about black consciousness raising it, you know, blowing its horn, so to speak, right, in, in, the, in the trumpets of bebop. So, um, so culture is incredibly important. It's not static. None of the concepts are static. So, when you, so I think you, you articulated it very well. You talked about, you know, you know race and culture. It's, it's a fluid, uh, for, uh, for us, um, it's a dialectic. I, it might not be a word that's particularly um, in vogue nowadays, but there's a, it's, a, it's a fluid interrelationship of these concepts that work themselves out throughout, throughout, the, throughout the books. So on one hand, he certainly, um, you might argue from certain points of view in Black Skin, White Masks, that, that um, what he says in, in The Wretched of the Earth is either a continuity or discontinuity. Mm -hmm. I think... Um, in an in a, in a interesting way, Fanon finished each book and basically said, um, that's done and I'm not going back to that book, I'm on to, I'm on to the next thing. Uh, Black Skin, White Masks, he doesn't really talk about it after he's written it. Uh, the same, he writes The Wretched of the Earth in 10 weeks. Why would he think that that's the last word? I mean, he dies, so it is the last word, but, but he certainly wasn't somebody that was summing up um, his, his own contribution. His, in a certain sense, I think Fanon's mind was alive, in the sense that he was always working out uh, and, and developing uh, ideas and, and, and reacting to situations in an existential sense, the situation and his own kind of practice within that situation. Um, that's why uh, I think it's interesting to think of his biography as part of his work, but not reduce his work to, to the biographical, not to say, well, um, because um, he uh, uh, was uh, from the Antilles. That meant that he was always an outsider in, in, in Algeria and therefore didn't particularly, didn't really understand the, the Algerians, which is really what Albert Memmi said, but it's also what others, which, what others uh, more uh, uh, recently have said, you know, that, they, that, his, that his work is limited by his biography. I don't think that's true. But I do think the biography is important uh, to the work. And so when you think about a totality, I'm thinking about also his, his psychiatric writings, mm -hmm. you know, which, which are quite minor in a certain way, but are interesting in the sense that he's trying to deal again with concrete situations. How to deal with, um, he's applying again, he's uh, trying to apply theories that he's learned in France, sociotherapy, which is probably the most radical at the time of, 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 of social, uh, psychological theories to specific situations in North Africa and they're not really working so he has to kind of revise that and, and, and it's a self critique as well as a, a critique of of the sort of ethnocentrism of these theories so it's a mind always work and so that's what's interesting to me that that you can look even at minor psych, psych, psychiatric writings and see the see him trying to work work the stuff out mm -hmm. because as you know um, uh, Nigel there is a tendency uh, for black nationalists, for example, most particularly within the US, to singularly focus on black skin and white masks to the exclusion of the wretched of the earth to a significant extent, and most particularly the cavalier rejection of the essays in moribund colonialism. 
have always wondered why black nationalists in particular glamorize, if that's the right term, black skin and white masks when I knew now that the wretched of the earth is much richer, much more complex than black skin and white masks says, but certainly not to black nationalists. I wonder why. Well, it's interesting. I'm not sure whether... I mean, black skin, white masks is very rich, and, and it's rich in a different way. It has a mo Intellectually, it's very rich. I think that's why it's actually interesting to some of the post-colonial uh, scholars. Mm -hmm. I mean, Homi Barbar's, although he, he did write the introduction to the Wretched of the Earth in 2005, I mean, he became famous in a certain sense, quote unquote, by, by, his, in, by his engagement with black skin, white masks, because he was intellectually seeing, reading it through Lacan and the kind of notions of, um, of, of, uh, of ambiguity and, and splitting the black skin white mass, a splitting of the black subject. So in a certain sense, you could say, you could read black skin white mass through Homi Barber and say it actually doesn't have anything to say to black, na black essentialists. Mm -hmm. People who essentialize race could not find anything essentialist uh, in black skin white mass because this old, whole notion of, of the mask and splitting and the identity being split and formed through the mirror, Lacan's mirror stage and so forth and so on. So, you know, I, I think, it, I think it's interesting, there's an interesting relationship between, um, and I'm not sure who you mean by black nationalists, but I'm thinking of the black power movement, um, because, um, you know, if you read the, 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 you know, the books by some of the black power movement leaders, um, they were particularly enamored with with Fanon of The Wretched of the Earth. I'm not sure they read it um, as closely as I would have liked them to read it. But in other words, there was that notion amongst some black militants and black nationalist militants that it was Fanon of The Wretched of the Earth that was more sort of engaging to that politics of the street, uh, to, that, uh, to that sort of the death of the, the colonizer, the death of, of the white man, the death of the internalized white man and so forth, um, than black skin white masks. Although black skin white masks, both actually, interestingly enough, quote from uh, Amy Cazare's poem where he says, you know, I broke down the master's door and killed the master, uh, the white master. Um, and the, you know, the Amy Cazare's play, I think, the dogs were barking. Um, in black skin, white masks, it's the internalized master. It's all about an internal revolution, a revolution of, about the, uh, the ways in which you've internalized the values of the white master, yes. even in terms of the struggle, the white master's values, the white master's notions of liberty, and so forth. It doesn't mean that there is an essential value to, um, to black values. He's not talking, Fanon is talk, not talking about black values. He's talking about a new human values, right? That's in Black Skin, White Mask. In The Wretched of the Earth, he uses the same quote from Amy Cazare uh, to talk about literally killing the, the, the colonial master. So I'm not sure whether, in fact, some of the, uh, that's why I think some of the, 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 uh, the black power people who were certainly um, found analogies with, with the wretch of the earth. So I'm not, I mean, I, I can see a certain misreading, quote unquote. I mean, I don't want to be the, 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 uh, the judge of all readings, but I can see certain misreadings of certain elements of black skin, white masks mm. that would say, you know, it's all about, it, it's a total, it's a just an utter rejection of, uh, of, of whites. And it's all, and it's, and it's a notion of, of, there's some kind of black essence, but I'm not sure whether, whether Fanon in the end is saying that. That is the kind of um, reading that I was alluding to. Uh, not that I think it is right or wrong. I, yeah. I yeah. leave that um, up, to your the <laughs> up to the readers. Yeah. But it is this kind of piercing, I think, um, that has for uh, quite a while uh, dominated the early uh, Fanon literature this obsession with the idea of race, mm -hmm. which 
some nationalists only find in black skin and white masks. Right, right. It's interesting because, um, I mean, he goes, I mean, it, it, there's a sort of narrative of black skin, white masks, where mm. he, he goes through the, pro, the process of, of embracing negritude. Correct. And saying, you know, I, have I found the source and so That's forth, right. in embracing uh, Leopold Senghor's, Correct. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, racial essentialism. That's exactly. Um, but you have to carry on reading, right? Absolutely. Because he, at the end of that, he just weeps and says, no, that's not... Exactly right. That's not going to do it for me. What, how does that... And there's a class element there at the end yes. of the book, too, where he yes. says, well, how does that help the poor uh, sugar worker in, you know, in, in the Antilles? Absolutely. So they, and then, they already know they're black, but it hasn't made any difference to them. That's right. This needs to be something else. Exactly. And then um, in The Writer of the Earth, there is that famous line, um, in which uh, Fanon challenges himself and his reading of Marx, and he is very quick and shrewd um, not to contribute to misunderstandings in the future. It's a prophetic argument um, in which he says something uh, like this, um, that from the fact that he's using the lens of race, uh, to analyze the material conditions of the poor, it doesn't follow that race is going to replace class. Rather, he is merely asking the Marxists, he does not even invoke Marx directly, the Marxists, and I think he might have had some vulgar Marxists in mind, uh, who do not recognize the centrality of race within class, a centrality that should be revisited and re-expanded so that the expansive concept of class itself could embrace race, not be in parallel with it, but embrace it, to use your term, to make it part and parcel of this living totality of the oppression of the condemned. Yeah, no, I think I think you put it very well because there's that it's it's, it's this, there's a sort of sentence that that sometimes causes some grief amongst some of my students where it, it's something like you are um, the superstructure and base switch and yes. you're you're white um, above a certain financial level or something That's like right. that. Um, one so which, it also shows you the sort of malleable, you know, the notion of the inventedness of... of absolutely. Of, uh, to, of to help you the phrase, I think it's something in which um, uh, Fanon says, uh, ironically, one is rich because one is white, and one is white because one is rich. Right. And one is black because one is poor. One is poor because one is black. This is where he is deliberately juxtaposing the way race and class work together inseparably. But his detractors read it reductively, such that whiteness becomes a metaphor for wealth, as if there are no pools among the whites. Right, right. And similarly, blackness becomes a metaphor for wealth, uh, as if there is no uh, poverty among blacks, which leads me to another question um, on a very perceptive piece that you, that, 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 that you wrote, which I read very carefully and which I even uh, plagiarized to an extent uh, in one of my columns, in which you deliberately chose for the first time the concept of the poors. You made the term poor plural, the poors of South Africa. Right, right. Why did you do that? Well, actually it came from a book by Ashwin Desai, um, mm -hmm. and it came from a struggle in Chatsworth in, um, in, in the early 2000s. And pause is the word um, that uh, Indian South Africans use when they're talking about poor people. Mm -hmm. So it actually comes, from, it's, it's, it's their term. That, I, see. Um, that, I thought that it was, was yours. Yeah. Yes, that, that uh -huh. I was using. But it, but it's it, again, it really relates so wonderfully to um, 
the, the, one of the critiques that Fanon is doing, doing in Black Skin, White Mask, but also in his yes. other works, in, in that um, it's not simply sociological terms, it's about the objectification of people. So yes. interestingly in South Africa, what, what used to be the whole notion of blackness was associated with, and, and, and in the US too, associated with criminality, with, um, with, uh, um, with drugs, unemployment, violence. Being or, a problem, as or, Du Bois exactly, famously being a problem called as, it. As du, Bois, as du Bois talks about. And now what happened in South Africa is that, um, in other words, being a non-person, being a non-being, not really being a person, being a person you don't want to be around, right? So, uh, and, and now uh, that's exactly the way that shack dwellers, people who live in the informal settlements, feel that society talks about them. In other words, you don't want to go to a shack settlement, it's dangerous. Now, of course, it could be dangerous. I'm not saying it is, it, it might not, you know, I'm not saying it's, it's heaven or anything. I'm just saying that people, normal people live there, that shack dwellers are just normal people like everybody else. But that is, uh, they're pathologized, in other words, that, that uh, if you find out, if you're at a, uh, a, 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 a bar with uh, some people and you're talking to somebody, uh, you find out they live in the shacks, you might not want to uh, be friends with them. Yes, that's right. That kind of thing, that yes. kind of objectification. Yes. And so that relationship between race and class and that relationship between the pause, the pause was, going, was almost like talking about black consciousness. It was now, you know, a new category of, um, of consciousness that transcended in the South African situation, um, you know, ethnic the apartheid categories which people still were living through, Indian, coloured, African, okay. and so forth. That was transcending that in a, in a class sense, but, but not in a sociological, simple class sense that was, as the vulgar Marxists might put it, but one enriched by all these, you know, uh, all the different people and all, all the different cultures that were coming. So, uh, Nigel, correct me if I'm wrong. I think um, you read my mind. Um, I'm so grateful. So, it appears as if Fanon deliberately chose his terms. It's not an accident that he did not use the term workers. Instead, he deliberately chose what you may call universal and universalizable terms that embrace race and class, manifest in the concepts such as the wretched, yeah. the condemned, and now through the Desai Indians, the poor. I find the concepts themselves to invite complexity. Yeah, I mean, think about Don't even, uh, or even the no. notion of the wretched of the earth, which is a debate in Fanon's studies. Where does he get it from? Now, of course, everyone knows the wretched of the earth. It's in the song of the Internationale that came out of the Paris Commune, a French song. And then uh, Jacques Roumain, the uh, Negritude poet, uses the, the, the Dame de la Terre in, in, in a poem. So, again, there's, there's two sources already so you can't so you can't ask Fanon so he's already playing with the Play sources so when, he, sources. when he's talking about Wretched of the Earth he's talking about this tradition that's both one of uh, the French you know the Paris Commune but also one of Negritude poetry and hate the Haitian Revolution right so again he's he's uh, whether consciously or not he's, he's drawing on many different sorts of sources to think about these terms the titles of the books are fascinating yes um, a Dying Colonialism in English That's is right. in fact uh, year five of the Algerian Revolution. Now year five of the Re Algerian Revolution relates to the French Revolution, which as you remember, anyone, you know your history, year one was 1789 and year five, so in other words, it, it's, it relates immediately back to the French Revolution. So he's tying the Algerian Revolution to the universals of the French Revolution, which were at the same time universals that, 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 were, not, that were not carried out or defended. 
he criticizes all those universals at the beginning of Wretched of the Earth, talking about human rights and so forth, and universals of liberty, and, 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 and all the great ideas the Europeans had uh, have, not been, have not come about. And uh, they're, you know, famously, I remember having, you know, this one liner, so to speak, you know, uh, when, uh, when, when the colonizer hears the word culture, he reaches for his knife. In <laughs> other words, you know, culture is all about high European culture and it's about Shakespeare yeah. and, 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 and so to speak, the, the, the wretched of earth have no culture, they are non-beings. They just are re they react, but but he sees that as a positive thing because um, because there has to be a rejection of of all those colonial values and colonial culture that that have basically meant that you as a culture simply as Amy, uh, Amical Cabral put it get on the on the end of the Europeans you know you're just at the back of the Europeans yes. you have no culture so you have to sort of reject all that all of that European culture, but at the same time, that rejection is itself not enough. Not enough. You know, you have to go through a process of, um, of sort of not only finding your own culture, but also um, a changing culture as well. That's remarkable. And now uh, we have about um, 15 minutes left, and um, may I have the um, challenging task of asking you, to, to, to think with me about the idea of race. Mm, as you know, in the analytic tradition, um, the idea of race is um, a conceptual problematic. And there are those who think that insofar as we do not clearly and plainly know what race is, then we don't have the license to use it because its usage is going to reflect the confusion. I call this the logistical approach. Then there is the existential approach, I think, um, which tries to uh, understand the idea of race um, from the practices of those who may not be conceptually confused or clear for that matter about the idea of race, but who feel its living impulse and then uh, develop the senses of identity um, out of this impulse, um, however it's, uh, irrational it may sound. Which of these tacts do you think is Fanon struggling with? in all his works. It's I mean, I don't know if he's really, he's fairly dismissive of, um, of the analytical in a certain sense, I think. I mean, when I, he doesn't really engage it, but when you were speaking, it reminded me of that, uh, of a quote he uses from uh, actually a colonial administrator, Sir, Sir Alan Burns, who, who um, is a liberal. It's really a liberal tradition, right? The, the analytical tradition. Um, and uh, he says to Alan Burns, he quotes Alan Burns, racial prejudice. Oh, good. I found out what the whole thing is. Racial prejudice. That's that's the answer. And of course, it's not the answer. It's not the answer at all to have an to have a, a concept. Racial prejudice doesn't really answer his experience. So it is about experience. Um, it is. In a certain sense, um, he has to begin from there. I mean, I think Fanon is, a, is an existentialist, not um, in, in an individualist way, but um, in the sense of trying to understand, um, un, un, understand experience uh, in, in, in a social, in a, in a, in a socially, okay. which is why I think the you know when he when he speaks about. Um, the lived experience of the black, which is the fifth chapter of, of the Wretched of the Earth, I mean, of Black Skin, White Mask, it's, it's incredibly powerful and, yeah. and, 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 cons and resonates because he's working out the way in which he's actually put together by something else, which yes. is the racial gaze, right? Yes. The objectification by, by, by society, which is essentially a white society, a society that's uh, the prism which you see everything through is, is, is whiteness. 
okay. white values and so forth. So I think that, um, you know, conceptually, even though, as you said, it, the, uh, uh, you know, in, in your question, that there's enormous ambiguity and, and uh, um, one is, it's very difficult to sort of uh, catch what race, conceptualize race uh, um, in this way, that, that it is about lived experience, and yes. that's the truth. Yes. So again, I mean, it's not, uh, it's not a postmodern notion of truth. It is a truth that comes out of uh, the, the, the sum of these experiences. Absolutely. And now, um, I can't help but ask uh, the following question. Um, uh, partly because um, your work, uh, and I have heard many celebrating it, precisely um, among other things, uh, for the sustained attempts that you have been making uh, to contemporanize Fanon, um, readily present in this last work that you did. I like the subtitle, Fanonian Practices. I wonder what Fanon, had he been alive, would say about the phenomena, the Arab Spring, <laughs> the influx of uh, migrants from the age of two onwards, if you have been following the uh, recent migrations of Central Americans uh, mm -hmm. to the US, and the borders are being closed against the doors of one, two, three-year-old babies, all coming in search of a better future, trying to decondemn themselves, de wretched themselves, and then they encounter further wretchedness and further condemnation. I wonder what Fanon would say both of the those who are living their lands in search of opportunities and those who in their behalf are fighting for them and creating failed states. Right. I mean, it's a fascinating element to when Fanon talks about, you know, the, the city in, um, in the first chapter of Wretched of the Earth. And he talks about, you know, the city of bright lights and roads and yes. hotels and Beautiful everything. Beautiful passages, yes. Uh, and on the other hand, the shack settlements and yes. the shanty town, people don't have shoes and so forth. Yes. There's no light. Yes. So there's always, and then he talks about this biological necessity for people to move towards, exactly uh, right. you know, for survival, so yes. to speak. I mean, psychologically and, and mentally. To exist. To, to exist. So there's always that movement uh, right, yes. of, of people. And Pushing then, back. You and know, and, 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 and <clears throat> which gets us, in a certain sense, to, you know, to the wretched of the earth, the, uh, the song which is, um, which is about the wretched of being the majority of the world. So, it's, so when you talk about the 99%, this is literally um, the people of the world who are, who are... The poor. The, who are moving into mm. these... Uh, and, and, and the creation, you know, so, so in a certain sense, one could say contemporary globalization with its global cities and citadels and... And, and all its security and so forth is Absolutely. just a contemporary sort of uh, manifestation of what Fanon was talking about. Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, you know, in, in the wretched of the earth. And, and phenomena like the, the Arab Spring are this continual, um, in another part of the world, the continual movements for freedom against the corruption and, and the uh, kleptocracy and, and neo-colonial apparatus that... Um, that uh, the, of, of, of uh, the decolonizing movements of which he sp spoke. Absolutely. You know, in other words, the same, you know, the period of the 60s and 70s degenerating into um, these neo-colonial um, authoritarian regimes, whether they're religious or secular. So, you know, so perhaps constant forces and movements to, to overcome, but on the other hand, violent suppression of those very movements, Precisely. which, again, he, you know, he, sp he spoke about. I think your next book, uh, if I may modestly suggest, uh, would have to be a complex treatment of this metaphor of the global city of the rich and the global city of the condemned. 
I think, yeah. which will be another major Fanonian practice that he can write about. You're so good at the grounding theory in practice. That, I think, is one of your admirers mm, find fascinating in you. You're not merely producing intertextualities. You're producing living practices in light of theoretical promises, always guided by the lens of the struggle for existence, human existence. Well, we have about uh, three minutes left. The interview has hardly begun. I have tons and tons of questions in my mind. But I um, mm. gently invite you to consider being a regular contributor to African Ascent, so that you could come once a year and um, give us the global reports on the human condition. Well, th thank you very much, Ted Ross, for, for inviting me. And, and, you know, what you said about theory and practice is really, and the human condition, is exactly what, what, I, what I try to do. Very much so, so. I appreciate very much this, this opportunity to speak with you tonight. No, it, was, it was wonderful. You've stimulated me so much uh, that I'm uh, going to make uh, Fanonian, uh, the Fanonian book my summer reading. If there is um, something that you would like to say to, to my audience, a huge number out there, this is an opportunity for you to do so. We have about one minute left, I think. Use it in any way you want. Okay, well, I hope, um, I hope it's been a stimulating conversation so that uh, your audience will go back to their copies of, of Fanon or perhaps find them on the, uh, uh, in the bookstore or uh, you know, online and uh, have another look. Mm -hmm. I think he's a tremendously interesting uh, figure. And you might also, if you, uh, if you so like, uh, share your um, email uh, uh, with the audience sure. uh, so that they can respond to the interview and uh, to your works. I believe it's Nigel underscore Gibson at emerson.edu. That's exactly right. Well, this has been your host, Theodros Kiros for Afghan accent. <laughs>